It's a great honor uh, for me to introduce Daniel Boshkov. I'm going to read a short statement about his work um, that lays out a few things um, as a, a bit of a preamble um, and an introduction. Daniel Boshkov is a Bulgarian-born artist based in New York City. He employs a variety of media from frescoes to performance and videos and works with professionals from different fields to activate the public space. He enters the worlds of genetic science, department megastores, world famous tourist sites as an amateur, intruder, and visitor who also functions as a producer of new strains of meaning into seemingly closed systems. Bajkov is a recipient of the Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome and grants from the Foundation of Contemporary Art, Andy Warhol Foundation, and the National Endowment of the Arts. His work has been presented at PS1, the Queens Museum, New York, Santa Monica Museum of Art, Los Angeles, as well as international exhibitions such as the current 33rd Sao Paulo Biennial in Brazil, which was what, like less than a month ago. Still St well, it's still on, but it, was, it just opened like less than a month ago, yeah. Um, I'm particularly excited about seeing some of that work. Um, the sixth Liverpool Biennial of Contemporary Art in the, in the UK, the sixth Mercusil Biennial in Puerto Alegre, Brazil, the ninth, is, the ninth is Instan, Istanbul Biennial in Turkey, and the first Moscow Biennial of Contemporary Art in Russia. Daniel Boshkov is an Associate Professor of Art at Hunter College, New York, and has taught as a lecturer at Columbia University, Yale University School of Art, as well as a visiting critic in the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam, Netherlands, and the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, as an aside, I think he's one of the most innovative and exciting artists working today, and personally, he gave me easily the best studio visit of my life, and it was a real honor for me to bring him here and, and share his knowledge with some of my students. So with that, Daniel Bajkov. Can you hear me well? Yeah? Uh, thanks, Cooper, for this introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and thank you for everybody who is coming in this kind of weather. Um, it's kind of thrilling to uh, see you here. And, um, I had today, uh, I mean, I had the privilege of several days kind of like inhabiting the grounds here and uh, seeing some really great stuff in the print media studios. And um, today, particularly, we had a fantastic tour with Kevin Atkinson of the Siren and House. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for coming. But uh, that tour was like really uh, kind of mind opening. You know, I, I, I love to, uh, and hopefully something in my work would kind of communicate that, that thing of like, a, I love encountering people who are so deep into what they do and passionate and also uh, somehow kind of live with it, you know, live in a, in a kind of profound sort of uh, mm, like 24 hour way with, uh, with what they're actually uh, working on and uh, once that happens things kind of accumulate and they um, somehow create almost like another kind of genre that's usually we don't encounter it's beyond information it's beyond that specific kind of like job of um, I don't know being a scholar of Sarin and of um, it was really exciting so thank you um, I'm going to show a few works and uh, I want to start with this piece which is um, Quote, Darth Vader tries to clean the black sea with Brita filter. And it's, uh, um, it's actually a television piece that I did in uh, uh, Bulgaria, um, where I bought uh, television time on one of the stations. And this is on the, uh, basically on the, co uh, th there is this coastal town called Burgas, which uh, I'm from. And uh, so the piece was basically uh, 15, uh, sometimes 20 seconds, you know, they had two different versions, where Darth Vader would uh, uh, simply kind of like a grab some water from the sea with a Brita, let it trickle a little bit, pour into this other bottle, and they just kind of pour the bottle into the sea. So it was kind of like a circular thing of, uh, and it's very interesting that, uh, I mean, I don't know, Black Sea is uh, one of the most polluted waters in the world. And I had in my mind this idea that, um, nothing can clean it. I mean, we, we as a civilization almost like are not able yet to, we don't have the technology to clean that deep and that much. 
Chernobyl went there. It's a major disaster. But so we almost like a, you need like a badass hero of that kind of mythical proportions and slightly unreal kind of somebody, somebody almost that comes from the urban myth or that kind of metaphorical space to kind of start cleaning something like that because the, the re reality of it is kind of untouchable. So um, anyway, uh, the, the, the piece was uh, really meant for television, meaning uh, when you're in that area, you would kind of flip through the channels and you, you know, bump into that kind of 15 seconds of this. And you can, for a second, confuse it with a Brita commercial because it's kind of recognizable. And then you, and the piece is really quiet, so you just hear the wind and this sort of the water kind of. Uh, and then at some point you kind of, you have this little stop of like, what, you know? Uh, <laughs> what's being exactly sold here? And, and I'm, I'm actually very interested in that space of, of, of sort of like, a, how to say, uh, it's almost like black market or something, like uh, importing something just under the radar into, the, uh, into that kind of like a, uh, just the way Cooper said it, like a, when the systems are too closed or too kind of clear or something, that's when it's really getting to be interested, interesting to me, you know. Um, uh, I usually go for, um, uh, again, uh, stereotypes, cliches, things that uh, seems to be all too obvious or too uh, as if we're kind of done with it, with that type of content. And I'm trying to kind of like inhabit that space or that location or, um, anyway. Um, the next piece I'm going to show is a short video. Um, uh, I'm, I'll show um, um, sort of like a fragment of it. Uh, it's called Flag. Um, I did it soon after I, um, uh, I was kind of um, actually studying for my American citizenship test um, in the early 2000s. a second to start, I hope. No? Rhode Island, uh, Delaware, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, Who wrote the Star Spangled Banner? Uh, <coughs> Frank K. Scott. What is the national anthem of the United States? Star Spangled Banner. Who was the president during the Civil War? Abraham Lincoln. What did the Emancipation Proclamation do? Uh, free the slaves. Which president freed the slaves? Abraham Lincoln. What are the 49th and 50th states of the Union? Alaska and Hawaii. Who were America's enemies in World War II? Germany, Italy, and Japan. Who was Martin Luther King Jr.? Civil rights leader. What are the colors of our flag? White, red, and blue. How many stars are on our flag? 50 stars. What color are the stars on our flag? White. What do the stars on the flag represent? The 50 states. How many stripes are on the flag? 13 stripes. What color are the stripes? R uh, red and white. How do the stripes, what do the stripes on the flag represent? The 13 original states. What is the capital of your state? Albany. Who is the current governor of your state? George Pataki. Who is the head of your local government? Nancy Blake Weber. Um, so this is uh, Edward Hopper's uh, uh, birth house, uh, childhood house in Nyack, New York, where I've had a, a studio for 10 years, uh, kind of on the second floor at Edward Hopper's bedroom. Um, it's run as a small art museum now. Uh, it's on the National Register. Uh, but when I was uh, kind of inhabiting that space, it was really low key, so I can kind of at night open the door and go upstairs and work and all that. And the house was all empty and, you know, uh, kind of available. Um, 
really interesting to work in a place like that because, uh, for me, because, um, I don't know, Ed Edward Hopper has this kind of very emblematic um, uh, sort of position in a way as a sort of um, painter who always is sort of slightly behind his time. You know, very powerful painter, enigmatic painter, but the time he was working on, the way he was working uh, was way kind of anachronistic in, in, in relationship to so many other actually cutting edge sort of uh, uh, artists who were working at the time, painters including. So at the same time, he tapped into something very kind of distinct, very sort of, uh, uh, it's something between uncanny and like some profound dark American sublime kind of runs through his images. <clears throat> so for me, uh, like having kind of been here for a while, it was one of those kind of like, it's like a portal, like a vehicle to kind of experience something that for me at first felt foreign and exotic, and then slowly, you know, maybe living in that light or something. And I saw this amazing um, program, Whitney Museum a few years ago had an exhibition of Hopper, and uh, uh, among other things that were like studied around his work was um, the light, of course, in his work. And they interviewed um, uh, some expert, kind of who was a Broadway light designer, who was invited to talk about Hopper's light. And she had this amazing, interesting, kind of very thorough analysis about uh, how most of his work, if you actually look at it from a point of view of like a, where is this light coming from, or you know, how is this light produced, uh, most of the light is completely impossible. There is no sunlight that does that. You know, does, you know, there is something kind of exaggerated. She called it almost like radiation, you know. <laughs> in, and there is like one particular painting with it. It's called Sunbathers, where people are kind of sitting on the chaise longs, and the light is hitting, and the shadows are black and enormous long. This is not the, the kind of <laughs> your regular sun. You know, it's something that's really kind of hitting there. So I was very excited to be in this place, and at night, well, first, let's see during the day. Um, these stairs go to the second floor, and he actually uh, uh, painted from several windows of the house and locations. So it feels like the house is really kind of almost like being in his head or something, you know? Um, so for instance, this particular, uh, I sort of st studied it wh while I was there. He actually sat on, on the seventh uh, step from, from, the, from the bottom and actually painted down um, this painting, and in typical Hopper fashion, he would like a uh, work from observation and then ch change something majorly, like right where the let's say where the porch is going to be. Suddenly, he puts this kind of really dark forest. Or um, anyway, this is the house inside. And it's particularly amazing kind of at night when the house almost like comes to life and there is all these kind of sounds from the wood and, and also like it's full of this, uh, um, kind of enigma of, of, of this artist who, he was there until uh, maybe his 20s and then kept coming to that house. His sister was living there. Um, I think it's full of, uh, if, if, again, if you know his paintings, it's actually quite, uh, this is his bus stop. And the drain of it, which I, when I was kind of hovering around and thinking about different that details and windows and stuff, I started thinking about the bathtub, like drain as a aperture, as a kind of way of almost like a, <laughs> You look through this and you kind of like look through the underworld or something like through some sort of like the, where, where that darkness is actually hiding. Um, and, uh, and then I had this uh, sort of like a few years ago, this chance to spend some time in Hong Kong. I was invited to do this residency and the building I was, uh, where my studio is, was this kind of incredible, it was basically the British Royal Air Force officers mess a building where the officers didn't live, but uh, they came to, you know, celebrate things together. Uh, something very well built with all this kind of granite that, that there is a lot of it around Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And um, 
the interesting thing about it is the climate is almost like subtropical, but uh, every other room in the building had like this grand Scottish granite fireplaces that nobody would use as a fireplace there, but they were like there. They could have been used. They, they were not just kind of props. They were so. Um, anyway, I started feeling particularly sort of like a the whole building. Like I started thinking about it as some weird kind of ship that kind of keeps traveling through different. Um, and I, I, I was not necessarily focusing or interested in colonialism, like per se, but like a. Um, it certainly felt like a building out of place in a way. Huge banyan tree next to the two sides of the building. Anyway, uh, what I thought of doing while I was there, um, I worked with several painting students to actually make, uh, we worked on four uh, different uh, replicas of Hopper's paintings without changing anything. We, we just kind of like made copies of them, painted, painted copies of them. But then the way we did it, um, we actually, four of us had like a, an easel and a that kind of mini kind of painting station with a palette and whatever. And then every few hours, we would kind of like a change the painting we're working on. And painters here know that like a, uh, at least traditionally, like your palette is pretty kind of private territory, really kind of a, an amazing place that you kind of organize your mm, colors, but also your color sense. It really depends where your where your yellows are next to you. I mean, it's a really, really personal thing. So there are actually people who studied palettes of artists as a kind of way of getting further into their work. So uh, our actually, mm, you know, merry-go-round of kind of uh, painting stations gave us a lot of that kind of exposure to each other's kind of uh, ways of thinking through painting or uh, painting experiences, uh, but based on Hopper. So Hopper became or oh, the Hopper's world became like a, some kind of platform that we, we actually step on and, and kind of speak to each other without necessarily talking, you know? And that made me, uh, I'm very interested in particularly that, that kind of moment of, of um, um, where a painter uh, who has certain kind of very distinct over, uh, the work can be actually kind of re reused or uh, the Hopper that's in the museum is one thing but can you revisit that site and open it up again and do something like that that's actually, uh, it's not the museum hopper, it's not the hopper in hopper's terms, but almost like starts with hopper and goes somewhere else completely. Um, very, uh, we, we worked on this for about two and a half, three weeks, and uh, like within the few days, all these kind of differences started kind of like a, uh, we, we realized that each one of us is kind of like a, uh, particularly fond of one particular corner of the painting, so slowly all these differences of us as painters kind of started kind of manifesting a little bit in the copy. So if you actually look closely, uh, one can see like a, who kind of fall in love with a particular kind of detail and actually spend a bit more, like too, like too much time on it. Um, okay. And then uh, one more thing before I show you uh, a, a couple of videos related to the project. I realized by living in Hong Kong at that time <clears throat> is that, um, you know, the British were there until 1997. So uh, in 1997, they kind of officially handed back Hong Kong to the Chinese. It was a very dramatic day, very kind of rainy day, kind of sober. And anyway, uh, when I was there in 2016, um, among the other things I kind of bump into as information, uh, was one thing that um, since 1997 in Hong Kong, uh, there was particular kind of peculiar proliferation of uh, backpipe bands, like a military bands. You know, something that was, when the British were there, uh, you know, certainly the, when the military was there, there was like a band connected to each unit, like the Black Watch or to some of the other units that were there. Uh, but when the, all the military left, those units, of course, left with them. And what was actually, what happened a few years later, uh, there would be some kind of occasional expat kind of lingering. And that person became kind of a, started a, a band. And then, so by now you have, when the British were there, there were like seven military bands, six or seven. And now there are 25 in contemporary Hong Kong. Just for comparison, New York, which has like a, about 400,000 Celtic population, kind of. Uh, 
has something like 12 or 13 bands. So this 25 is a lot. And for me, that became almost like this kind of weird residue or trace of, um, I don't know. I, I don't know what this next generation of, uh, of Chinese actually thinking about that kind of colonial past. You know, there is a, some kind of complex, um, but let's see if this video will play. So what happened is basically the whole kind of like ceremony of, of walking the paintings through the grounds a couple of times and then we, we sort of like deposit them in, in, in the ground. Um, this is uh, maybe a couple of months after, after that happened. Um, this is uh, the next year and uh, there is very little trace of it now actually. So um, I kept thinking about this piece. I, I call it Edward Hopper Deposit, but uh, I keep thinking about of it as a sort of like a, I, I studied after that like a, a little bit, you know, the history of, of the work and especially in relation to that part of the world. Uh, there is no much kind of relationship between Hopper and Hong Kong. I don't think there is a single actually original Hopper in any Hong Kong museum, um, as far as I know. Uh, and there is no much other, I mean, some, let's say the artists or the, mostly the painters maybe, but the artists would know this American painter, but uh, kind of he's on the sort of general periphery of it. Um, <clears throat> and then, so there is no that kind of link really until now, because, but now there is. There is this sort of like a, um, you know, something underground there that, it's still there, and now I, in my mind, I have this kind of like almost like two parallel directions of how the piece kind of keeps kind of progressing. One is I'm sort of thinking about like a um, maybe a couple of years from now there is a, a really kind of amazing um, national heritage museum in Hong Kong uh, for me to make like a proposal and formally kind of like a invite them or try to interest them to do kind of like a 
uh, excavation with the proper, you know, all the language of archaeology and all that, and see what they would find. And, you know, because by now, you know, several years, people who were at the original kind of performance, you know, there was no, I mean, I don't know if people still think that that's there, you know, like, are they interested? It's, it's, the whole thing is kind of, so uh, that's one direction I'm thinking about, like more like a, in relationship to, let's see what, uh, what that particular kind of object, um, like how it changed, but also how it would change in relationship to some other forces unleashed over it. And then the other direction, which is actually equally, and maybe even more kind of compelling to me at the moment, is more like a, to let the whole thing actually slowly dissolve into a complete sort of, uh, 20 years from now, only like a six, seven people would kind of might at some point tell you a story, you know, there was a 20 years ago, somebody buried a hopper there in the middle of, because, yeah, uh, soon you won't be able to find where it was exactly. It's in the east lawn of Kai Tak. Um, so anyway, that's the Edward Hopper deposit project. Um, I'm, I wanted really to show this piece because like the more I'm, I'm working, the more my work is becoming this kind of, um, um, I, I start getting really interested in this not only collaboration with reality only, but that type of uh, understanding that the work is actually, um, I'm not the one who, who, who is responsible to finish it or to kind of, I, uh, even if I want to, it would never be. And that has something to do with like a old conversations about death of the author and all that stuff, but it's actually much more, <clears throat> I suspect that ultimately, uh, the reality, at least the, the way I'm experiencing it, is actually completely in such a flux that it's kind of absurd to even to aim that way. To say, I made this, and then I'm presenting it here, and I'm kind of done with that. And then it's actually more, I personally, I'm getting more and more interested, like a, I made this, and then if I leave it over there, what would happen to it? You know, what, what who, I'm actually interested in, in exactly its sort of, transformation after I did what I could have done to it. Uh, and now I'm going to show a couple of pieces that actually start sort of like a, and actually all the pieces that now I'm understanding in a different way, but now I'm going to show my most recent work. Um, and the whole, by the way, talk is not chronological in any way. So um, the piece I did at uh, Sao Paulo Biennial um, has the title of My Dear Highly Venomous. And I work with the scientists uh, who, from the moment we, we tried to talk about it, made this very clear to me that I have to make a distinction between poisonous and venomous. Because poisonous is something that you, if you can eat it, can poison you. While venomous it has this active moment that <laughs> things that sting and kind of harm you, you know, you don't have to harm them, they can harm you before that or something. And, uh, Oh, this is actually another project here before that. Hmm. Shall I skip that one? No, I'll show you. First, I'll show you Walmart. Sorry. That makes more sense. Um, this is an old piece. And there, I, I worked in the local Walmart at, in Maine um, as a greeter for some time. Here's my, uh, the piece is called Training in Assertive Hospitality, which is basically a, when you're trained as a greeter, that's the Walmart term. Um, and assertive hospitality means if you're a greeter, you have to kind of very quickly start helping the customers to orient themselves in that kind of warehouse of goods.
where I find uh, Crass and Yan? Yes, they're this way. Okay. All the crap and the stamps and the other materials, right? Yes, and, and Yan. What you're seeing here is the other part of the, of the same project. I asked the manager and they made the design and I painted the fresco at the layaway department at the store. And the, the fresco actually involved this kind of like a, this long consecutive sort of like landscapes where you have this objects that are kind of you can buy in Walmart. Um, there were local scenes, you recognize like a local building or a church or, and then uh, uh, also scenes from like people celebrating 4th of July or whatever. Fresco is a very interesting kind of medium, has this kind of incredible, you just work with uh, pure pigment and water uh, on a wet lime surface and it creates this kind of really luminous surface when the lime dries out, it, the, there's this luminosity embedded in the medium. And there, uh, one of the mm, ghosts at the Walmart was actually tried to kind of really match the palette of everything so it didn't um, you know, stick with anything. At that point, Walmart had a, a gray and blue palette, so that was one of the requirements. And here are some details. So the piece properly started when uh, the fresco was actually painted and uh, you know, uh, I discovered that since it's the layaway department, you know, you need that, that those kind of objects to be kind of in f all the time around and they actually change very often like every few days. Uh, and I started uh, taking images of that and realizing that actually that's the life of the piece completely out of my control. There was this kind of like an impermanent installation that keeps adding and taking away. Uh, there were days when you can almost like not see the piece, but then, uh, so you might actually turn that corner and not actually kind of, you know, notice that it's there. But I love the moments when you actually, at the moment when you notice it's all of a sudden like, you, you really don't know what that is. It was like real sort of, might give you some kind of a break uh, out of something that actually completely camouflages itself. So for instance, in the course of several years, this is the panel uh, on the left, uh, sorry, on the right uh, lower corner um, that had this local bar painted and, and a mixer next to it. Um, four years later, this is the way the bottom part of the, of the painting looked. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like a, mm, at that point, I, um, I just wanted to see what the state of the, of the painting can actually, you know, how can it be taken from here? So I invited the Italian restorer Renato Giangualano, who recently restored Tiepolo frescoes in Brescia, to come in and actually make a kind of restoration evaluation report with me. So uh, he came and he actually, it was amazing because he, he kind of, uh, he came up with this concept, abrasiones, abrasions. And for instance, those kind of, let's say that l uh, bottom sort of like long score, that's not an imperfection in the plaster or some sort of defect in the, uh, in the actual, you know, how the work is painted or something, you know. This is somebody kind of pushing a big refrigerator this way and not paying attention that this thing is there at all. So um, in a way, uh, it was kind of like the perfect kind of like a moment where the, these two realities met and just didn't almost like, you know, it's kind of uh, scored into each other. So. Anyway, the conclusion of Renato's um, uh, report was basically that's, those are the areas that needs to be preserved. You know, it's actually how to conserve that particular kind of like these kind of damages. Um, several years later, uh, Walmart changed their uh, colors corporately from uh, gray and, uh, and blue to beige and tan. Uh, and then the manager of the, of the store uh, called me and asked me if I want to 
take the the you know the fresco away because uh, um, you know they they can't keep it with that sort of like a discrepancy between palettes. So I went and and uh, removed the frescoes from the wall. This is uh, the wall after I, I I you know kind of took the wall uh, the fresco down. This is the way the wall is now. A kind of double monochrome, and. I just want to add one thing that, like, uh, I was particularly interested to start this project, like, uh, and again, this was one of these typical pieces that took, like, uh, several years to get to the point. I'm not sure if it's now completely finished, but it has this kind of, like, a long durational um, track. <laughs> Huge part of it, which is, of it, is not in my control. Um, but, uh, anyway, it, it, it became kind of an example of, of something that I've, I'm, kind of interested and want to pay further attention to. Mm. So here's the project that uh, I started talking about before. Uh, my dear, highly venomous. Uh, it's actually inspired from another older piece, which I'm going to show you a little video that entered into, into the whole constellation of several objects and, and things that were embedded in this project. Before that, I just want to say one thing that Actually, in one of the studio visits the other day, I think uh, I was talking about like a, at some point, um, John Cage and Merce Cunningham came to uh, this place called Skowhegan, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, which is uh, this residency in Maine, which I'm very dearly kind of connected to. Um, I was still in Bulgaria when I applied to it, and I came directly from Bulgaria there, and I stayed in the States after that. So when John Cage and Merce Cunningham came, came somewhere in the sort of late 60s there, they were invited to um, have a sort of like a, what they thought they were invited for, for a lecture, to give a lecture there. But they arrived and <laughs> half an hour before the, the hour of when they had to start, they realized that they expected actually to do a performance. And being who they are, of course, they just kind of, said that like a, we'll just kind of activate all the objects that are in this room and make kind of noise with each one of them or something, you know? And the pace was really uh, amazing, but uh, at some point when they were actually talking about it later, somebody asked them like, a, can you explain your work or can you talk about how do you, uh, how do you kind of define the character of your work? And I think John Cage at that point said something that's very kind of dear to me as a, as a sort of, um, almost like a mind opening or something. He said, uh, well, less like an object and more like the weather. And for me, that kind of, I don't know what to call it, like a, it's not a description exactly, but it's kind of like a, almost like a mm, attitude. It's something that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a very interested in and particularly manifests itself in this piece at, in, uh, in Sao Paulo. <coughs> So uh, here is a video where the whole thing started from. I'll show you just a, a little portion of it.
So um, this piece is called Nebuchadnezzar, like the Persian king from the past. Um, and the next thing that actually enters in this work is uh, back to the idea of the venomous. This is this very venomous uh, snail, uh, marine snail, called Terebra subulata which um, um, I have a little video here, very bad quality, but it's from the lab that actually works with this nail. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. So basically, uh, the snail actually uh, kind of shoots this tiny harpoon uh, with a venom so potent that actually can kill like an enormous animal, like a really big animal, way bigger than this fish that uh, it's actually needed for, for the snail to eat. So uh, that venom uh, is used by scientists now um, directly and after that kind of s trying to be reproduced synthetically uh, to make the most potent painkiller known to men at the moment. Um, it's about 1,000 times stronger than morphine, and it's not an opiate. Uh, only is administered in, in, in very, very uh, kind of end cases of like extreme pain, because to administer it, you, you have to inject it directly into a spine. The, the kind of the molecule is too big to cross the bl blood-brain barrier. So. Uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Mande Hoford from the um, Laboratory for Biological and Chemical Diversity of uh, Cornell West Well uh, Medical Center in New York City. So her team um, and her lab is trying to actually turn this sort of painkiller into a, into a pill, in, uh, that which will be an incredible revolution in. So working with Mandy made me think a lot about pain in general. Um, and uh, again, I, I've spoken to some of the students as well about that. It's still on my mind. This idea that pain is one of those kind of incredible territories that, that uh, you're both aware that uh, it's almost like the limits of empathy are, are kind of like a manifested there. Because simultaneously, if somebody is in pain and you immediately empathize because you maybe had a pain like that or whatever, uh, or just as a human you're trying to kind of, uh, or 
naturally uh, imagine that pain. At the same time, the very second, you're basically aware that you, you are not experiencing the same pain. You, you're kind of completely separate from this other being which is in pain at the moment. So it's one of these kind of like a, um, things that actually simultaneously connects us and completely allow, allows us to understand that we are super separate and there is no way of really connecting on that level. Um, so anyway, that, that was one kind of like a initial material that I actually started working with. Here is Mandy Hofer talking a little bit about the, the, the process for a second. So in pain, for example, there's several targets inside of the human body that, are, um, that act as, I guess, stimuli for pain. And when we're trying to target different things, we look for things that are going to hit those different stimuli areas. The drug that's on the market, Freault, from cone snails, targets M-type calcium channels. And we know that if we shut, stop those channels from functioning during chronic pain, it will stop the pain for, you know, not indefinitely, but for a long time. Uh, so what I started doing with this, uh, I mean, I kind of, I was in the lab, I, I kind of spent a lot of time kind of uh, uh, during their meetings when they were reporting on the, on the different stages of the progress of, of the project. And then at some point I had this idea of, uh, I wanted to work with three different ballerinas in three different parts of the world to actually, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you one of the pieces and I'll tell you more about it. So this is in New York in another part of the same lab, Cornell Well Medical Center. So uh, I would think that in most of my work, this probably is the one that has the most impossible sort of like a like test or hypothesis that kind of, I wanted to see, can I impersonate the snail in some ways, but, but, but uh, uh, by, by different sort of like a guises, you see in, in kind of in different fashions, using different tools and stuff. So with uh, Jordan Miller, who, who was actually um, until recently a, uh, like a, a dancer at New York City Ballet, uh, we talked about this being a, a kind of like a, um, a, a choreography uh, between kind of the snail, her, and, 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 this, uh, and the Roomba uh, just giving us, uh, you know, Roomba robot to give us the kind of the keys of the movement.
The next segment is actually uh, in the Black Sea, <laughs> where Darth Vader keeps cleaning. <laughs> This is in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. It is filmed uh, before the biennial at the pavilion uh, where the biennial actually happens, which is this incredible uh, building uh, designed by uh, Oscar Niemeyer. So it has this railing that is beautifully kind of sinuous. It's a bit like the Guggenheim kind of spiral, but way more free and floating. Here in Brazil, uh, actually had a shell that was kind of life-size. And uh, I'll, I'll show you later a little bit of the performance. Uh, we had several performances, but uh, the important element of that was actually I worked on a, on a musical instrument. And this is really this amazing guy. This is um, Chuck McAlexander, um, who is a, for years run in New York this place called the Brass Lab, which is one of those fantastic sort of old shops that was working with almost like every big musicians of that time who needed any kind of tuning of a trumpet or something, including uh, Dizzy Gillespie and, and his kind of famous sort of crooked trumpet. Uh, I have a little snippet here. Dizzy Gillespie really liked the tone of that kind of, that produced by the crookedness of the... So uh, we basically used one shell. Uh, we used like a um, what's called like the regular Western silver sea flute, um, and also the other element was a black plastic flute that I actually found uh, secondhand. And uh, the idea was actually to have that kind of instrument be played by two people, by the snail on the floor and the ba ballerina on the top. Um, in Brazil, the most amazing thing happened because I, I was able to find this, uh, it only exists in Sao Paulo, this uh, dance company, which is uh, pretty much mostly for blind ballerinas. Um, and they have like several dancers that are not blind, but most of the, and, and the idea is like, a, it started by Fernanda Bianchini. And it's part of many, many that kind of like what I, in my mind, called kind of Brazilian projects, which uh, from Paulo Freire talks about that to uh, many, many others that, that kind of involve this kind of almost like impossible. So you can't walk really, you need like help to, you know, but can you dance, you know, that level of like real pushing the limits of, of uh, um, a little I know about the ballerinas, uh, kind of, especially classical ballet, it's a very, very formal discipline with very, very kind of like a, it's not like a modern dance, you can kind of improvise and do anything. It's actually the, this very strict steps and uh, 
rigorous sort of like a movements and forms, how does a person who does not see or doesn't see completely well actually gets to learn that? It's amazing to me. And, uh, you know, of course, there is a lot of touch and a lot of uh, other kind of senses involved. But uh, anyway, um, Veronica Batista is the ballerina I worked with in Sao Paulo. And I'll show you the, the moment here where she and I perform. So here's the installation of the banyo. Um, it had this protruding sort of like a, what I call viewer, where uh, from there you can actually see the um, that first video I showed you with a with a snail sort of like a biting. Um, here were many of the the videos were actually shown on this other side, and there were a number of frescoes also as part of the, of the kind of installation, and they were more like a uh, so, for instance, this is a diagram of pain, uh, some weird sort of like a um, staircase that Leonardo designed, and they were uh, kind of completely finished. Uh, this commuter train kind of like um, sort of vortex that I was interested in. All of these are kind of like field notes towards the project. They're not kind of directly uh, picking fragments of the whole thing, maybe a couple of them only, but they're, they're just kind of like a... Um, yeah, basically made on the way. It's almost like using fresco as a documentation of, of, a, of a kind of thought process. Um, they were kind of shown in this kind of part of the building that actually almost like took part of the railing as well. And almost like you have to walk around and actually see them. They were not, they were sort of uh, kind of hard to see. You have to kind of swirl around to find each one of them. My wife, Susanna's eye. And this uh, sort of like a glass, it's almost like an aquarium uh, was basically, uh, it's like a depository of the, of the instrument. So it became like a stored sound. I, I didn't want to show the, the flute as, as a kind of whole object, but this was the flute kind of dismantled and, and uh, shown in this kind of 
so you can see it from both sides. And sometimes actually see somebody looking at it from the other side. It was like an aperture of the, of the building. So this is my dear highly venomous. Uh, time is kind of advancing. I, I'm going to show another very uh, quickly another couple of pieces, so I'm going to skip a lot here. Bear with me for a second. Yeah, this is, I want to show you this quickly, and then one more very short video. Uh, this is a piece I did in Istanbul, um, where if you've been to Istanbul, every like corner of the city has this kind of, uh, you know, somebody selling this pretzels called simits. Um, and they're like the absolute staple, like a, every few hours you kind of get one of these. Usually each cart is connected to a bakery, so they're kind of freshly baked, warm, um, dipped in molasses, sesame seed, crunchy pretzels. So uh, I was invited to do something for the Istanbul Biennial that year, and uh, I asked uh, the, you know, the host to kind of introduce me to a traditional bakery. But uh, before that, like a few months before that, I went there for the first time with my mother. I pretty much grew up like in a, almost like in an area that's about three and a half, four hours from Istanbul. But during the communism, that was like one of the most heavily guarded border between, you know, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, and it was impossible to go. So it was for us easier to go to like Paris than to ever go to Istanbul. And Istanbul is like the ultimate city of the of the area, or maybe ever, you know, like uh, so many empires have been there. But this is the it's like New York, you know, it's sort of like a, the ultimate metropolis, the city, you know. Um, so uh, it had this kind of imaginary charge that I, I, was, I was kind of uh, very excited to go there. And my mother, who was like 73 at that time, she's never been because her life kind of overlapped with pretty much kind of good chunk of the communist regime. So we were there, happy to be with each other and just kind of walk around. And she slowly started kind of like picking up this kind of, she would overhear something and say, oh, this person just said like a, uh, two dogs or something, or fountain or whatever. And I kind of, she started doing this quite often. So I first started kind of like writing those words and then maybe, uh, especially if we're in an appropriate area, just even check with the person who said that like in a shop or particularly in the big covered market in Istanbul, start checking like what's, did, did, like you just said this, but she, she thinks is that, is that true, you know, asking in English. and. Often she was right, and this made me think about this kind of like the linguistic deposits that, like, in the Balkans, this was part of the, of the Ottoman Empire, but my generation never caught that. So, I didn't know any, like I know like three Turkish words, and she she has a whole vocabulary, of of this other language. That's you know, it was very interesting to me. So, uh, I became an apprentice in this traditional bakery that would make these pretzels and learn how to make the traditional pretzel. It's quite uh, kind of hard for the hands to start working that way and it took me time and almost like a, um, probably some of the best sculpture lessons I've ever had were by Sami Ereumas, the baker, who would take my hands and say, you curve this way, you'll see it, I, ha I have a little video of that, you'll see, but uh, it was an amazing experience um, here. And then um, we uh, sort of like a designed out of my kind of mother's phrase book, basically, of Turkish. We pulled out nine words and designed like a new forms based on those, almost like a pictographic kind of words. Um, and I made a bag that actually in three languages, in Turkish, English, and Bulgarian, would kind of briefly describe the process there was this pretzel, the traditional pretzel with uh, my mother's face inside, and in the back were the pictograms, actually, of the, of the different kind of pretzels. And then I actually sold this on the street of Istanbul for like a couple of weeks. So uh, the way the day would go, like three o'clock, I would get up, go to the bakery, uh, help them to make the production of whatever, as many pretzels they will make that day, and then around six we'll make like my quantity of pretzels, which were kind of harder and slower to make but still, and then I would sell for until they're finished on the street. They sold really well, 
Saudara ke Armada Armagan 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 A kako ko znači Armagan? Tvoje, tvoje, tvoje podarak Še kupim na Roze jedin Armagan Baška Kako znači Baška? Odelno Do you know what is Baška in Turkish? When you say Baška, is there a word Baška? Baška is different Да различно значи. Да, ја утивам, утивам. На друго место. На друго место. Други. 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 На друго место. Други. Башка. Да. Чекам хар туркиш. Как се казва? Майтап. Како значи майтап? Е турска дума и значи смешно. Смешно. Да. What does it maytap mean in Turkish? Maytap. Is there maytap? Is there Turkish word maytap? Maytap. There is some word maytap, but means what? You know, uh, when you make fun, mm -hmm. oh. with your fire, I mean, you make the fire, something. Oh, so it's not a funny thing. It's my top doesn't mean like a, when you have fun. I mean, it's my top is... Uh, when you laugh at something, no? Something, something laughing, something enjoy. Nešto smešno kvec... saying more uh, more you know how, how is more more easy you know what is a uh, is like light a uh, is more he says the word uh, hat often When they start working at three in the morning, uh, I mean, this, the person next to me is teaching me, but the other person is actually, you can sleep and do that if you know how to do it. It's kind of still doze off, you know. It's amazing what the dexterity and the, the intelligence of the body can do, you know. A good friend of mine, a filmmaker, filmed this for me, and he really caught this moment where, uh, and I'm super interested in that moment where, where um, kind of somebody, uh, you know, the whole work is actually completely melted into this kind of the sea of this big city. And then somebody picks it up and then, 
at some point he kind of realized that, wow, there's something not, not quite the same here. It's something has actually changed in that. Maybe the back said, you know, but th that moment of kind of uh, altering the, and here is the, the way the pretzels always look in Istanbul, and it's like for 500 years they've been like that. Um, this is fountain, eye, curtain, tail, cloth, two dogs, and gift. So those, those last three, gift, two dogs, and cloth, were selling so well so that now the bakery keeps making them, you know, for kind of a number of years. And only you can find them there, nowhere else in Istanbul, you know, you get the shape. So um, that was the other moment that. Uh, I'm going to show just two minutes, two or three minutes video to finish, and then I'm happy to answer some questions if we still have time. Make the best possible work you can. Live deliberately, sort one thing at a time. You got to be deliberate possibility for artists that come behind us. I ask how is this exhibition contextualized? I Do not ever get anybody to tell Things are done because everything is negotiable. I painted the walls of the gallery once to make the things better. Do not ever let anybody to tell you how the things are done because everything is negotiable. Do not ever get anybody to tell you how the things are done because you because everything is questionable um, do not make short term choices Anybody can make a good piece. Not everyone can have a vision. Making art. Do not feel that you are not empowered. Do not make short-term choices. Take really good slides. I painted the walls of the gallery to make the things better. Do not ever anybody to tell to tell you how the things are done because everything is negotiable. To happen. Be really it is about elevating the discourse. I believe we are educators. About your work. Writer. What we do, what we do matters quite a bit. I painted the walls of the gallery to make the thing better. Don't ever. Don't ever get anybody to tell you how the things are doing are done because everything is negotiable be really frugal
Thank you very much.